Well, good morning, and welcome to the Refuge Church online gathering. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wider doors with a welcome from Jesus, the friend of sinners. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together. We pray that you would bless the hearing of your word and that you'd shape us and change us in this time. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I was buried beneath my sin. You could give me that kind of way. It was my Till I met I was beaten but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my Till I met You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness to your glorious day Now your mercy Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know that's good Oh, you me when I met you Oh, you called my name And I ran out of that grave oh, Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name Into your glorious day I needed rest My sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan You called me a citizen of heaven when I was broken, you were my healing. Your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. And when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into
singing with us. Let's turn our attention now to Holy Scripture, and we'll be in James chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 13. And as you're turning there, if you renew with us, welcome. James is an epistle. It's a letter written to a group of scattered Christians uh, persecuted for their faith in the first century that are struggling with a variety of issues. And over the past few months, we've been looking at each section of that book, and it has been, a such, uh, been such an immense help to us and today will be no exception. Let me pray and ask for the Spirit's help, and we'll get right to work. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and illuminate these texts to us. We pray that we would be informed in our knowledge of Scripture, transformed by the renewing of our minds, conformed to the image of Christ, and recommissioned on the Great Commission. Lord, help me, frail as I am, to serve us well in this time. In Jesus' good name, amen. Well, First thing to understand about this text is that it is written to a specific <coughs> subset of these scattered Christians. But even though it zeroes in on one particular group, we have a lot in common with this group of people, and certainly the counsel that James gives them applies to us as well. Now, who is this subset? Well, I believe this text is written to a group of successful, wealthy Christian businessmen uh, in this first century time period. 
they had likely been successful through a variety of ventures. You can, you can tell by the way that, uh, that James is going to speak to them in, a, in just a moment. And because of that, that success has gone to their proverbial head, so to speak. And it has caused them to plan and make assumptions about the future uh, in some problematic ways. And so James writes this section of the text as a corrective to them and also to us. It's very short, so let me read all of it for us, and then we will work through it a verse at a time. Beginning in verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, let's begin to dissect verse 13. So, the come now you who say could also be translated now listen. And it is a pointed call for attention that indicates the seriousness of that which follows. Uh, the present tense of the verb say that he uses there seems to indicate that this situation under consideration was not an isolated incident, <clears throat> but it was a problematic pattern, that this is how they were thinking and operating and planning uh, in, in light of their future. And when he thinks about this, there's a little bit of irony here as well, because these folks uh, had been persecuted in many ways, were still being persecuted, and still in the midst of this, <clears throat> they were having these struggles, and, and, and in many cases, it, it can be like those kinds of situations where we, we get ourselves in big trouble, we recognize that we really need God's help in, this mo in those moments, and then when things begin to get better, when the tide of trouble begins to recede, well then now suddenly we are masters of our own destiny, and we don't need God as much. And that seems to have filtered in to their thinking and subsequently their planning. But by converse, the first principle that we can take from this text is implicit with what James is saying here, and that is that proper planning always keeps God in view. Plop, proper planning always keeps God in view. This is right in line with what we learn over in Proverbs chapter 16, 9. It says, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And so the doctrine in view here with what James is saying, with the writer of Proverbs is saying, is of course the sovereignty of God, that God is ultimately in charge of all things. This is his universe. This is his planet. We are his people. All of our plans are ultimately subject to his divine grand plan, whether we recognize it or not. But we need to recognize it. We need to sync up with it as best we can. And all of our plans need to be subject practically and actively to his ultimate plan and to his will. But this is a struggle for us because this is antithetical to the way the culture operates. Came across this quote this week from uh, Kent Hughes, and he wrote this. He says, as the late Walker Percy's protagonist said in The Movie Goer, 100% of people are humanists and 98% believe in God. God is not simply a part of daily life for the culture. So pervasive is the culture's arrogant independence of God that even many Christians attend church, marry, choose their vocations, have children, buy and sell homes, expand their portfolios, and numbly ride the currents of culture without substantial reference to the will of God. Moreover, Christians never seriously pray about God's will concerning their vocation, family direction, or entertainments that actually seek God's will. They change Augustine's quote, love God and do as you please, to do as you please and say that you love God. Now that is a scathing indictment of the kind of mindset that had infiltrated this early church that, that James was speaking to, and I fear that it is a good corrective for us today as well. 
because the culture that we live in is so godless in the truest sense that that can have an influence on us as well. So let's pause and ask ourselves a few hard questions here when it comes to our planning. When we seek to make plans, whatever they may be, do they have God in view? Do we see ourselves as our own little sovereign in charge of our own planet and universe? Or do we recognize that we are subject to God as the ultimate sovereign, the ruler over the planet and the universe? Friends, we need to avoid the pitfall that these had fallen into, and we need to plan properly with God in view. Now, that's actually only the first problem that James speaks to with their planning, and he begins to pull out the rest of it in the rest of verse 13. So he says, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. So the first warning comes from the absence of God, and the second and third warnings come from the presence of this type of thinking. And the, the second one really comes down to this idea of they don't know what the future is, but they are speaking and planning as if they do. They are speaking and planning as if they have a crystal ball, as if they know exactly what's going to happen. And of course, that is not the case. And in fact, the last couple of years that all of us have been living in, we have certainly been reminded that that is true. But again, they are operating as if those kinds of things don't happen, that their universe is a closed system, which of course it is not. Now, the, the, the third problem that he points out here is uh, talking uh, seen in the next phrase, and he pulls an example from nature, and he says here, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And what he's highlighting there is the brevity of life, the shortness of life, the uncertainty, the, the, the uncertainness, the fleeting nature of life. And he does that in this very concrete illustration uh, of a mist uh, that comes from our mouths, uh, particularly on a cold day. All of us have been outside and you can see your breath and, and immediately what, is, what happens to it? It just fades away, it vanishes quickly. And that's what James is saying here. He's saying our life is just like that. It fades away almost instantly. And understanding the brevity of life is not just something that James cares about. This is important to many writers of the Bible. Uh, let me acknowledge a, a help, a debt to the um, Priest of the Word commentary. I always love to use their material. But I found their synthesis of some of this uh, bringing together the other texts on this issue uh, to be quite helpful. And it comes up time and time again in the book of Job, actually. <clears throat> Chapter 7 in particular, Job says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Just a few verses later, As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol and does not come up. Then a couple pages later in chapter 9, verse 25, he says, My days are swifter than a runner. The, my days go like the skiffs of reed. And then when you flip over to the Psalms, King David sings the same song, so to speak. He says, my days are like an evening shadow in Psalm 102, 11. And then Psalm 102, 3, for my days pass away like smoke. And then, of course, the, the most famous example of this, Psalm 103, 15, he says, as for man, his days are like grass. And again, the idea there is fading away, fleeting nature, a mist that appears for a moment and then is gone. So when you take all this together, it gives us our second principle, and that is that proper planning also includes a proper assessment of our limited knowledge and our limited nature. Proper planning also includes a proper assessment of our limited knowledge and our limited nature. So let's ask ourselves this hard question today. When we make our plans, do they have these truths in mind? The fact that we truly can't know the future. The fact that we are subject to all kinds of things that are beyond our control. And that we understand that we are here simply for a moment. That this life 
is very short, a mist that appears for a moment and is gone. But do we plan as if that's the case? Friends, again, James offers this grateful, this helpful corrective to put us back on the right path. And let me also say this too. I think there is a particular word of wisdom for students in this season. And here's what I mean by that. We are coming on to the home stretch of the school year. We ourselves have a senior that's about to graduate. And so we, we have these kinds of conversations all the time about the future and planning and so on. But there's a great story from uh, history uh, that uh, back in the days of Constantinople, that when an emperor was crowned in the Eastern Empire, the royal mason would set before his majesty a number of marble slabs and the thinking was there that when he was at his highest point, when he was being installed uh, and crowned as the emperor of the empire, he was also picking out his tombstone. And the thought that they were trying to drive home there was, at your highest point, remember that it is just a few short days until you're going to be at your lowest point, six feet under. And so all that you may accomplish in this life, never forget that you are close to passing in to the next life. And the idea of there, of course, was <coughs> to promote some humility uh, at this time of great elevation and so on and so forth. And so for us, that may sound a little creepy, but there's a great principle there and a great word for us there. There have been some other people throughout church history that have talked about uh, just taking a walk through the cemetery, walk through the graveyard, look at you know, how many people have passed, and, and it just gives you a sense of the shortness of this life. And it also reminds us of the limited nature of our knowledge. And so, again, these very practical things, think about how that important that would be for someone who's beginning their journey. So if you've got students in your life at this time, uh, just help, to help them understand. You, you, everybody thinks they have their whole life ahead of them, and we hope that's the case. But the reality is we don't know how many days we're going to have. And we need to always remember that God is ultimately in charge, that our knowledge is limited, his knowledge is unlimited, and our days are very short. And we need to make the most of them. So that being said, James now turns from illuminating the problem to now getting very, very concrete about the problem and saying, here's what's happening. And then in doing so, he actually illuminates the problem even further. And the way he does this is he, he really kind of takes a, a two-pronged approach that he's taken throughout this entire book. He, he talks about the sin on the outside, which is this improper planning. But now he also talks about the sin on the inside, which is going to be pride. To use the language that we've used time and time again here, he talks about the tip of the iceberg, the improper planning, and now he talks about the rest of the iceberg, the pride underneath the water. Let's take a look at it. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in arrogance, or boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, the way he gets at this, this uh, boast in your arrogance could also literally be challenged. You are boasting in your arrogant pretensions. And it refers to a proud confidence in one's own knowledge or cleverness, the arrogant nature. And what's interesting is, is it, it implies that these qualities are actually not really possessed. So you, you think you have all this stuff and you actually don't even have it. And of course, that is sinful. And the scriptures have plenty to say about how God uh, opposes the proud, and gives grace to the humble. And one of the, the one of the best worst stories that that deal with this of course is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. That here's this man who sets himself up, he heralds his greatness. There's an example in scripture where he walks out and he looks at the the uh, Babylon kingdom, probably the hanging gardens of Babylon that that he, that he said he was responsible for. Talks about how awesome and great he is and then just very shortly after that God strikes him with an illness where for a season of his life, he is eating off of the ground like an ox. And so again, pride goes before a fall. And so 
James is saying to these Christians, listen, you're operating in this arrogant framework. Step back from the precipice. Don't do this. Don't be those people. Instead, walk away from that pride and plan appropriately. And the way he talks about this, he gives it to him in this little phrase. Look back at it there. He says, if the Lord wills. Now, you may have heard that phrase. You may have said that phrase. Uh, it comes up repeatedly other places in the Bible. Paul employs it in Acts 18, 21, 1 Corinthians 4, 19. Uh, but he doesn't use it everywhere. So, so it's not like magic words that have to be pronounced over any plan that Christians make. But I think what he's getting at there actually leads us to our third and final principle. And that is that proper planning displays a humble, if the Lord wills, attitude. Proper planning displays a humble, if the Lord wills, attitude. And so what we're going for here is not simply a phrase, it's a posture. It's not simply a statement, it is a state of mind and a state of heart. It is not simply an axiom, it is an attitude. It is an understanding of all the things we've talked about in this passage up to this point, of understanding that God is ultimately sovereign and in charge, not us. It is an understanding that this is his world, not our world, that our lives belong to him. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And that kind of proper assessment and understanding leads to appropriate biblical humility. It doesn't lead to poor self-esteem and and, you know, well, those, those negative things, it leads to a proper Christ esteem and a proper assessment of who we are and our place in God's economy. And then that correct identity leads to correct activity, correct planning. And, and so it does lead to understanding that our plans are indeed ultimately subject to his plan. And so when we think about this, I think the best thing that we can do here is to go, okay, so practically speaking, how do we do that? What does that look like? What does it look like to have an if the Lord wills humble attitude? Well, I think the way that we're going to get that, let me give you just a few practical steps here. The first thing is it begins with the Bible. And some of the things that helped me on my journey and coming to employ this, at least more than I used to, is start with the, what I might call the, the sovereignty scriptures. Here's just a couple of examples. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. It's the same idea in text form of what we've been talking about this entire message. Here's another one, Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, but every decision from the Lord. And if we have some of those scriptures around, they're going to remind us of who's really in charge and, and what's really at stake here. And then if we move from that, let's dig into some of the stories. Think about some of the, the greatest hits of the Old Testament, so to speak. You think about the story of Joseph and all that he endured, even kind of on the home stretch of that after going through years of imprisonment and being forgotten and all the awful things that happened to Joseph. What did he say? He said, uh, what you meant for evil... God meant for good. He could see God's hand, his thread, in the midst of all that he endured. So he could see God's plan, even in the midst of the destruction of his own plans. Uh, you think about Daniel in the lion's den. You think about all that he endured, and yet he still understood that God was up to something there. Uh, many examples from the life of David. There's no way he could have uh, taken on and overtaken Goliath, apart from God's intervention in his plan. You look in the New Testament, you think about the, uh, the early church, you can see that they made plans, but it was very clear their plans were subject to God's plan. Uh, and even Paul talks about that when he's talking about his own journey. I was trying to get to this place, but the Spirit of God prevented me uh, from doing so. And so he recognized that the Lord, you, you know, what, what, uh, what the Scripture says, the man makes his plan, but the Lord directs his steps. And so I think if we are constantly reinforcing ourselves and bolstering ourselves in those kinds of truths, well, we're going to be in much better shape in living in light of what James has to say here. And then, of course, think, think about the life of Jesus. I mean, Jesus' entire life is an embodiment of what we're talking about and getting it right today. 
Uh, but one particular scripture, John 4, 34, where Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. You talk about somebody who understood his mission and what he was there to do and so on and so forth. Friends, there is no better example than the Lord Jesus uh, of this truth. So that's where it begins. You build your foundation from the Bible. Just swim around in this water and you're going to be pointed in the right direction. <clears throat> and then secondly, when it comes to making your plans, make them in pencil. Make your plans in pencil. And what I mean by that, I'm kind of winking when I say that, as you know, but it means that you are, you are making your plan for your vacation or for your finances or your, for your retirement or for whatever it is that, that you feel called to, to go and do, that you are making it with the understanding that you don't have all the information. You've got a lot of information. You certainly don't know what's going to happen in the global economy. You don't know what's going to happen with these other nations that can't stop fighting with each other. You don't, you don't know what our own government's going to do. There's so many things beyond our control. And by making our plans in pencil, it, it, it gives us a sense that we have done what we can do, what we're responsible for, and we are going to trust the Lord from this point on. Now, if we're doing this right, we're going to trust the Lord from the beginning all the way through. And so when you make your plans in pencil, uh, I would even say that the beginning of the planning process still needs to start with God. Uh, yeah, I know when I sit down and work on our family's personal finances, that the attitude with which I try to approach them is, God, this is all of this is your money. Uh, I just I want to be a good steward of it. Please help me know what, what investments to jump on, what to pass by, uh, so on and so forth, because it, it's ultimately his. And then as I make the best decisions that I can, they're still made in pencil, knowing some are going to work out, some are probably not going to work out, and we're just trying to do the best that we can and try to hold things with an open hand as best we can. And another kind of footnote on that under making your plans in pencil, uh, I would also add, be appropriately self-critical. And what I mean by that is not beating yourself up, but I mean suspicious of your own heart appropriately, of your own motives appropriately. And, and really ask yourself time and time again, because any you know, significant plan, there's, it's multi-step, there's multi-phases. And just because you might start in a good direction doesn't mean that on step seven, you're not going to suddenly be, you know, walking in great fear or great pride or whatever. I mean, we, we want to walk with God throughout the entire planning process, whatever it is. And so always be going back and addressing those issues, which gets me to my third and final practical thing. And that is to confess your pride. Confess your pride. Remember, that's the, that's the ultimate part of the iceberg that is the problem in this passage. The improper planning, that's just the sin on the surface. It is the arrogance, the pride under the surface that really is driving those problems. And you might say, well, Dustin, I'm not very prideful. I, well, I'm, I'm sure you're not. Uh, none of us want to be. But within ourselves, to think that we have completely got over that particular sin, well, that's just not true. Our pride can pop up at any time. C.S. Lewis said it is the mother of all sins. So anytime we're into some kind of shenanigans over here, pride is somehow related. And so my uh, suggestion to you, my counsel to you, is to, to live in light of what Martin Luther said, where he said that all of life is repentance. And we are always going back to God and saying, Lord, forgive me for not trusting you in this area, for trying to be my own little G God in this area. Please forgive me for my pride. Uh, give me grace to do better next time. And in, in, in just like breathing, as we are exhaling that sin of pride, we are inhaling the grace of God. Now let's bring all this together because we can't talk about pride and we can't talk about our need for grace and not talk about the Lord Jesus. But when we see this passage, don't we see Jesus between the lines? Let's go back and think about it again. Jesus was never guilty of operating outside of the will of God. He never on his own looked at this and said, hey, I got this, I can handle this. He was always fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and he, of course, was God himself. 
And so his perfection in this area and in all areas allows him to help us with our imperfection. And when you think about the, the real underlying sin here, this pride, this arrogance, friends, Jesus was the embodiment of the anti-pride. And we need to look no further than Philippians chapter 2 to see that. We go back to this text so often because it's so practical in dealing with this particular sin. Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this. He says, have, your mind, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. By taking on the very form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So there is humility embodied and displayed. That Jesus, in all of his perfection, still laid aside all of the benefits of heaven and he lived a very simple life and yet accomplished the greatest goal. The salvation of you and me and anyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And maybe today when you're hearing this, that strikes a chord with you because it's never happened in your life yet. You're watching this today and you're still trying to save yourself. You're trying to work hard and be good and hope that earns you a ticket to heaven. But friends, the Bible says that is just not possible. The only way we can get there is by trusting in what Jesus has done here. In his perfect life, his substitutes death, and his glorious resurrection. And we turn from our sins and transfer the leadership of our life over to Jesus, and we put our full faith and trust in him. That's how we become Christians. That's how we ultimately deal with with this pride problem. That's how we get on the train toward planning properly. It's through a relationship with Jesus. And if that turn has never happened in your life today, then my encouragement to you would be to admit that you're a sinner, believe in what Jesus has done, and commit your life to follow him. And then reach out to us. Shoot us an email, refugefranklin at gmail.com, and we want to help you as you are beginning this new relationship with God. Now, for those of us who've already made that turn, what is it that the Lord is saying to you most prominently through this passage today? Is it this fresh reminder of this Jesus who humbled himself? Is God using that to melt the pride in your heart, to correct your planning? Maybe it's in some of these practical steps that the Lord has given us to, to move more in this direction. Or maybe it's something completely unrelated. Friends, whatever it is, the Lord wants to help us today. He wants to help us plan properly for our good and for his glory and the good of the world. So whatever he's saying to you, let's take it before him now and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had. We pray that you would write this word on our hearts and that you would strengthen us for the road ahead. In Jesus' mighty name. There is
break every chain, break every chain. Well, thank you for being with us today. All we ask is that you take a moment, and if you're new with us, shoot us an email, refugefranklin at gmail.com. We would love to know that you were here and how we can help you on your spiritual journey. Of course, at this point, all of our uh, ministries are up and running, and we would love to get you connected to one of our men, men or women's groups, community groups, so on and so forth. Uh, and we just need to know how to connect you, so reach out to us and let us know. Also, I want to encourage you to continue to give and give generously so that the ministry of the church can continue. And want to ask you to continue to pray for us as we seek to be faithful to the mission that the Lord has given us. Let's pray together for our time that we've had today and have a great week ahead. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the ability to put the word out there in our lives in a variety of forms. We ask that you would use it and that you uh, help us on the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.